All right, thanks a lot. I appreciate it, Jay. Um, Ken Lehner here. It's a, really an honor to be able to uh, be the first of this uh, series of happy hour guests. Um, I truly believe that, um, you know, it's a great way, you know, it's, this is a perfect example of what's going on in today's day and age, you know, innovating and doing things different because of COVID-19. But, you know, we'll get to that in, in a little bit. But uh, thank you for finding the time. It is happy hour. Yours truly is not imbibing, but, you know, I encourage it. I've become a better speaker. You know, if you guys are having a beer or a glass of wine or whatever the case may be, uh, be responsible. That's all I ask. But, um, you know, other than that, you know, it's just a great opportunity. I mean, when you think back to Canisius High School, I mean, we've all been successful in one way or another in our life since then. And a lot of that is obviously owed to uh, the Jesuit community and school there on the corner of uh, Delaware and West Ferry. Um, and, you know, I was, I was fortunate growing up too that, you know, I had a chance to really excel in a couple of different areas of baseball. Uh, as I went along and somehow Jay managed to get into the archives and found a old baseball picture um, of, of me. There I am, you know, so my love of baseball started out at a young age, uh, played up. That was the Delaware Hurdle League, although I, I spent most of my time and had more of my success uh, later when I switched over to the West Side Little League. Actually, you guys, a lot of you guys probably know Ron Reculia. Uh Ron was a year younger than I. Ronnie and I played together over at West Side. And then also uh, eventually at uh, CHS together. Great, great baseball player, great quarterback too. So, uh, but yeah, and uh, actually, believe it or not, the guy behind me, that's my older brother, Chris Lehner. And uh, Chris was the catcher on our team uh, there at Delaware North. And uh, he, uh, or Delaware Hurdle, excuse me. Yeah, and he was a year older. So he graduated in the class of 84. So, so some really good memories there. And, you know, also just a great opportunity for me to get started in my sports career uh, as I, I was um, actually able to work for the Buffalo Bisons when I was in high school and also worked for the Buffalo Bisons uh, when I um, moved on to college and, and thereafter. So um, I know that there's kind of a slide that Jay's going to put up uh, with some of the, the destinations and the different areas that I've you know, been able to successfully uh, you know, go through my career. But you know, again, I definitely, definitely owe it a lot to Buffalo and Canisius High School and the Bisons. Although the Bison's logo was not on there, I, I do apologize. But, you know, great, great opportunity to work for the Rich family, uh, to be a part of um, the downtown resurgence at that time when they, you know, built Pilot Field, it was called, for the older people on the, on the call. Uh, you know, and that opened in April of 88. Tom Prince hit a home run to win the first game. It was cold that day, but you know, that was really, you know, the foundation. And so, although I've been gone from Buffalo, you know, since 92, you know, the, the Bisons uh, tried for years to, to get a major league baseball team under the leadership of the rich family, but uh, eventually lost out to the Florida Marlins and the Colorado Rockies. And um, I don't want to say that I jumped ship, but had an opportunity to head south in 92 after they awarded the uh, expansion franchise to the Marlins. So I ended up still getting the opportunity to be a part of a major league baseball expansion team, which was an incredible opportunity. I just wish it was in my hometown. Perhaps if it had been in my hometown, I'd still be in my hometown. I truly believe that would have been the case, but you know, destiny and you know, the journey takes you, you know, in different paths and, you know, all the stuff that you used to hear in grammar school and, you know, high school, you know, they'd be like, you know, you know, the adults that had already lived their lives, you know, make contacts and network and this person will get you from A to B. And, you know, you don't really understand that till you live it and you go through it. And there are connections with all these logos that you guys are seeing on the screen right now. They're, they're connections that, you know, the Marlins, you know, vice president of, of uh, communications ended up becoming the president of the Carolina Hurricanes. And, you know, his name was Dean Jordan and he liked me. So he hired me away to, you know, to go to, to Carolina at the time. And then there was, you know, other people that at the Lightning that, you know, saw the job that you did, you know, in a competitive environment, you know, marketing, selling tickets, idea generation and things like that within the division and then they say, hey, you know, why don't you come back to Florida and, you know, be part of our organization? And, you know, you just kind of work your way through. And, 
you know, it's different talking to people like you with experience than younger people. But, you know, one of the things that I always, you know, said to say to young people when I speak to them is that, you know, you got to be willing to take risks. You got to be willing to move, um, you know, and all these cases where you see these different logos where I've, I've gone from A to B, there was greater opportunity as far as responsibility, greater opportunity as far as money. I mean, I think at one point I moved like four times in 10 or 11 years, but, you know, you know, it helped me, you know, progress along the way. And, you know, then ultimately, you know, looking back, being in the right place at the right times to be able to, you know, win the World Series with the Marlins in 97, you know, which at the time was the uh, fastest an expansion team had ever won the World Series. We won in five seasons. Uh, previous to that had been the Miracle Mets in 1969. It had taken them nine years. But then only a couple of years later, uh, the Arizona Diamondbacks did it in like two or three seasons, you know. And, you know, that is all – you could really – dial that all back if you really dial into the details on that a lot of that has to do with free agency you know you didn't have the big free agency in the in the 60s with the Mets you know winning in nine years and then you know the flip side you could say well you know you didn't have as many teams back then either uh, which was true but you know then you know we went the the off season the baseball winter meetings in 96 December of 96 we added 73 million dollars to our payroll and free agents and now nowadays that's like like two years you know for a really good player but you know back then adding you know 73 million dollars of, of salaries uh, and the likes of players that did you know play roles in helping us win that world series in 97 you know darren dalton and um john cantalosi and dennis cook and you know names like that but then we also you know snuck across the border into cuba well we actually went to Mexico or Guatemala to get him to get Levon Hernandez and he got a five million dollar you know signing bonus to come play with us in 97 and you know he made an impact you know down the stretch in September and stuff like that so you know you move you move along and you know I grew up in Buffalo New York loving hockey so a chance to you know go from the Marlins to the NHL I couldn't say no to that and you know was was very fortunate to be in a situation similar to the, the Marlins from an expansion point of view, but not exactly the same because it was actually the Hartford Whalers that relocated uh, down to uh, Raleigh, where Rick Winook is, uh, and, and played in Greensboro for two years while a new facility was built. So, you know, that was a real exciting opportunity to, to be involved. And it was a very challenging opportunity from a marketing point of view, too, because um, there wasn't necessarily the expansion ramp up you know, like you get like where there's an expansion major league team or in any sport, you know, you usually get like, you know, a runway of, you know, love and a love fest with the fans and the community and all that. We didn't really have that when Hartford moved there to Raleigh, North Carolina. And it was very challenging from a marketing and communications position because it was, um, you know, a non-traditional sport in a non-traditional market. So like we really had to get into the ABCs of the basics of the game. So, um, you know, we were selling the real, I mean, I remember the first, one of the first marketing campaigns I ever did, and, you know, Rick Lanook might have been there, but, like, we hired Richard Petty to, like, to be our spokesperson, you know, the NASCAR driver, to, like, you know, try to go and compare the positives and negatives, sorry, that's my dog, the positives and the negatives of the similarities between hockey and, and racing and things like that. So, that, that was a, that was a big challenge there, but, you know, very successful. We ended up, you know, making it to the Stanley Cup final in 2002, and unfortunately we lost to the Detroit Red Wings. But, um, you know, a couple of years later, you know, took the chance, moved back to Florida and ended up winning, you know, the Stanley Cup in, in Tampa in 2004. So, you know, to look back and be so grateful to be in the right place at the right time. And, you know, I was always on the business operations side, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, so I had nothing to do with deciding what players got signed or traded or released or whatever per se, but you know, we all had to work together, you know, to make, make it a success. Um, and then actually while I was in, in North Carolina, I went to, uh, Duke and went to get my MBA at Duke and, you know, people like look at this like graph and they go, Ken, you know, what happened? You were in the major leagues and now there's all these minor league logos and things like that. But the number one thing that I learned at Duke was like be your own boss and, and like be an entrepreneur and, you know, you know, make money for somebody, make money for yourself. 
And I mean, they just, I mean, they, the first day of school, they planted that seed and then they just hit you over the head for the next two years, you know, about, you know, be your own boss, make your own money. And so, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't get it out of my head. And so that's where you see, you know, the Rockwood Boulders and the High Point uh, Rockers out here. You know, those are independent baseball teams that I helped start, that I helped own. And, you know, that was, you know, after a lot of, a lot of thought and going, okay, you know, I worked all these years for people that had, you know, wealthy people, you know, millionaires, Mr. Rich from Buffalo, and I may help make money for him. And then I helped make money for Mr. Carmanos, who, you know, started copyware out of Detroit. He owned the Hurricanes. And, you know, then, you know, you get uh, Mr. Izinga at the, you know, he was a billionaire, you know, working for a billionaire, you know, at, at the Marlins. So, you know, you kind of go and do your own thing, and then you get into a situation where, you know, when you're truly at the top, you know, when you own something, it's a whole different animal. And when you try to start something, I mean, one of the things I tell people in speeches is that if you're an entrepreneur, if you're starting a business, and I don't care if it's sports or widgets, you know, you never have enough time and you never have enough money. And, you know, that, that, that proved true with the bowlers, that proved true with, with the rockers. I mean, you just, you know, you have a date, you got to get open. You know, if you don't get open, then you really start to, you know, burn through your cash and stuff like that. So um, great, great experiences. And, and a couple of these experiences here, I had an opportunity to actually uh, work very closely in the design with the architects and with the construction management folks as well to actually build the facilities uh, within which we played. And I don't know, part of me in retrospect, instead of being like a public accounting major at Fordham University, which is great because it's always good to know the numbers, like I really feel like if I had a second calling, I would go back and try to become an architect. I uh, really enjoyed that part of the business and, you know, looking at, you know, a facility and how do you take concrete and steel and bricks and mortar and lights and and make money with it, you know, but not only make money with it, but, you know, make sure the fans have a good experience, make sure it's, you know, comfortable for the players, you know, a place where the players want to come if they have a choice to come to your facility. So at, at the Marlins, you know, one of my first jobs there was to oversee construction of their spring training facility in Vieira, Florida. And man, this really makes you feel old because we signed a 25 year lease and that 25 years is already gone. And unfortunately the, the Marlins moved out few years uh, before the lease ended and built a new place down in Jupiter and then the Nationals, well it was the Expos and the Expos and the Nationals came in and finished up that 25 year deal but I think it was 20, I think it was 2016, yeah 2016 or 2017 was the last year so it's been like two years now that they haven't had spring training there but great little project, biggest project you know I ever did as far as acreage, it was a hundred acre project because you had the spring training stadium itself which was 8,600 seats then you had a big area for parking in between and then you had to build the minor league complex which was like six fields and and um, clubhouses and training facilities and batty cages for your minor league players so that was the biggest but believe it or not it only was 20 million dollars it was only a 20 million dollar project and that uh, stadium opened in 94, although the Marlins started in 93. Um, we played uh, one temporary spring at Coco Expo down the road. But in 94, when that opened, it was the largest spring training complex in the state of Florida, 8,600 seats. It was the first spring training complex to have suites. Um, we had 11 suites. It was uh, the first spring training complex to actually put the offices into the facility itself on the top floor to give it extra height and oomph and, and presence. And then uh, two years later, the Yankees opened their new stadium in Tampa and it was 10,000 seats, like 30 suites, taller than ours. I mean, it was just like, it was like this arms race of facilities that started with spring training. And, you know, spring training is very profitable. I mean, the players don't get paid. The major league players don't get paid until April 15th. So all during spring training, all that money is going directly to the bottom line. So did that and then had two other opportunities to really, you know, sink my teeth into building baseball facilities. And that was with the Rock and Boulders. Uh, we ended up building a $65 million stadium there on about 32 acres. Uh, it had 6,000 seats, 16 suites, 11 loge boxes, you know, Metro New York, 25 miles from George Washington Bridge, 
uh, independent baseball, which, you know, is different than affiliated, um, but very, very successful. And then uh, most recently uh, took the last two years to uh, build BB&T Point down in, in High Point, uh, North Carolina. Another beautiful stadium, smaller. Um, we only built that one about 4,100, but that was the market. The league that we were in there said you had to be at least 4,000 seats minimum, but we didn't feel like the market could bear doing much more than that. But really nice uh, ballpark, unbelievable uh, scoreboard. And, you know, that ballpark came in uh, in the neighborhood of 60 million as well. So uh, th th those are great opportunities. And um, I'm very thankful to have done all those. And now I, you know, I'm just kind of advising some people on some things. You see some logos across the top there that we'll get into a little bit later, but those are my current projects. And, uh, you know, very excited about uh, this and very thankful to be able to work in professional sports. So that's kind of the overview, Jay. Perfect. Um, so we do have, we've had uh, a few questions uh, come in ahead of time. So I'm going to open it um, right up to questions. Let me get out of this here for, for a minute. Uh, there we go. Uh, There's the crew. There they are. So the first question um, that I thought we could start with was from Brian Spears. He's class of 08. And the question that Brian had was, from a marketing and communication standpoint, which success impacted your job ability more, the 97 Marlins World Series win or the 04 Tampa Bay Stanley Cup? Uh, considering that neither one of those markets were really solid in terms of attendance at the time. So Brian, I'm going to unmute you if you want to talk through that at all anymore. And, and Ken, I'll, I'll open it up to you to answer that question. Yeah. Hey, Brian, I just, what did you mean by impact of my job ability? Is that like my ability to do the job or like after those events happened, was it easier to market? Can you, yeah. can you clarify? Uh, how much impact... How much impact it had for you to market after those successes? Oh, after. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Well, listen, that's a great question, but I have a terrible answer because in both situations, it turned into it turned into a nightmare. And I'm just being honest. Uh, in '97, it was a nightmare because prior to winning the World Series, Mr. Izinga got very frustrated and publicly announced that he was going to sell the team. So in particular, it was uh, like the last weekend in June of 97, and um, the Yankees were in town Friday, Saturday, Sunday, interleague play, back when it was really fancy and cool to be interleague, and you have tons of Yankees fans in Miami, Florida, obviously. And it rained all three days. We got rained out Friday night. We got rained out Saturday night. We played a double header on Sunday that was just a, a wet mess. And uh, then they they left town. We never made up the other game. And it was like one of those things, well, if we have to make it up at the end of the season, yada, 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 we'll make it up for – and so he came out on Monday and, like, we didn't even know he was going to do this. He, like, called the press conference and he said, you know what? He was trying to get a stadium built. You know, you're not getting a stadium built sick of losing money, uh, you know, I'm putting the team up for sale. And we were like, whoa, you know, that was just like a shocker. And then we ended up winning the World Series that year, and we were hoping that would maybe change his mind. But um, truth be told, we lost $34 million that year, the year we won the World Series. And, um, you know, the, Wayne, I mean, you know, God bless him, he passed away last year. Yeah, you know, Wayne, you know, didn't love baseball. I mean, I'll just be honest with you. He, he did not love baseball, and he told me this. And I, I remember one time, at one time, you got to remember, I mean, this guy was a billionaire, and Blockbuster was relevant, and he had owned the stadium where the Dolphins played. He owned the Dolphins. He owned the Marlins. He owned the Panthers. I mean, this guy had it all. And uh, I remember picking him up one day. Uh, he was flying into opening day of spring training, and I picked him up at the Melbourne International Airport on one of his jets, and it was a half an hour drive from the airport to the facility. And um, <laughs> we, we get, we, he lands on the tarmac, comes through the private executive airport. All the people are like dressed properly and standing there, you know, all the workers at this little executive airport. And uh, they all want to shake his hand and stuff like that. And we get in my car. Wayne goes, Ken, do you think that was a little odd? 
I go, I don't know. I go, you're Wayne Isenga. I mean, people like want to meet you, you know? Because no, 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 it's not it. No, something else, something else. Hold on. Gets on his phone. He calls his CFO in South Florida. He goes, oh, really? Oh, okay, well, it makes more sense now. Okay, I like that now. Boom. Hangs up. He goes, uh, I own that place. <laughs> I go, what? He goes, yeah, I own that. I own a bunch of executive airports. I didn't know. He goes, they all work for me. I mean, like, that's how, you know, like, big this guy was and everything like that. So we're driving to the stadium, and I go, well, what do you want to do when you get there? We're going to have, like, a half an hour before the first pitch. And he goes, well, I don't really want to go see the players. I go, why would you say that? And he goes, oh, I don't, you know, the baseball players, they just – I go, I go, Mr. I think it's like opening day of spring training. And he goes, I know he goes, but you know, I, I really like the hockey players best. They're so nice. They're all, they dress nice and they're appreciative and they're from Canada and Europe and all this stuff. And they're just nice, you know? And uh, then uh, he goes, the football players, you know, if they win, they're the greatest. And when they lose on Sunday, you know, you don't want to talk to them till like Wednesday or Thursday. And then they start to get back in a better mood. But then you don't want to talk to them Friday or Saturday. And he goes, the baseball players, he goes, you remember the strike? You know, you remember their union being powerful and all that? And, you know, he lost a year. I mean, you know, he got the expansion team in 93. And then the players went on strike. You know, there was no World Series in 94. And then there was replacement spring training in 95. So he just didn't, he just didn't like the, you know, the baseball players. So uh, I guess when you think about all that, then maybe it wasn't that surprise that he just doesn't consult anybody and announces he's going to sell the team, which is his prerogative. He owned the team, right? So we were, <laughs> this is why it's a, a nightmare. We were the first major league baseball team in history to win the world series in 97 and have a lower season ticket base in 98. <laughs> I mean, I kid you not. So that probably wasn't good for my career. On the flip side, we had a disaster in, in Tampa too in 2004 because there was no, no hockey in 2005. I mean, there was the lockout in 2005. And so the only good thing, and it was a really good thing, was we got to keep the Stanley Cup for two years. You know, normally you got to give it back opening night. So we would have to give it back in you know, October of 2004. We didn't give the darn thing back till October of 2005. So, you know, of those two situations, definitely was better, even though we didn't have hockey in 2005, because we had that Stanley Cup. And after it came back from its summer around the world, visiting all the players, that was in our office. And we did whatever we wanted with it to, you know, expose it to the fans and the corporate sponsors. And that really, that really helped us. You know, obviously only one team gets to do that during a lockout, and it was us. So that was huge. So good question, though. Thank you. All right, Ken, uh, your classmate has a question. What is truly driving the MLB decision relative to minor league affiliations? You know, money. <laughs> I mean, the short answer is money, but you'll come to learn I don't really have any short answers. So that can be a very long answer. Uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, at the end of the day, you know, it's just a different system. I mean, the development of a baseball player is just, it's just different. I, I don't want to say it's mentality or moving parts, but, you know, one of the things that Major League Baseball is jealous is about is that the NFL and the NBA have this, like, automatic feeder system from the colleges that they don't pay anything for. And, you know, they get these great players that step in and play the next year in high school a little bit with basketball, too. But, you know, and, and they're never going to be able to get to that model with baseball because – Baseball isn't as, you know, well-rounded around the country with respect to, you know, high schools playing it and colleges playing it and things like that. I mean, you know, you can play basketball anywhere in the country because it's indoors. You, football, you know, it's a fall sport primarily, but people will play in the cold weather, even if they're in North Dakota or Montana or whatever, you know, in high school and college. You don't have that same pipeline with baseball, with college baseball. So if you go back in history – there used to be like 400 minor league baseball teams in America, like back in the thirties and forties. And they had like class D and class E and all this other sort of stuff. It wasn't just triple A, double A, single A. And that was really good for the economy, especially during the war years and, you know, that sort of time. But the fact of the matter is when uh, only 3%, 3% of players that get drafted by a major league baseball team ever make it to the major leagues, 
and it costs on average about $2.8 million to get that player from being drafted to the major leagues. And, you know, listen, you can, you can debate that number, but this is a major league baseball number. And that would include like a signing bonus in there. And that would, that includes, you know, workers comp that they have to pay and salary that they have to pay and equipment they have to buy. And they got some formulas how if, you know, they had less affiliates, they'd have less coaches and all that sort of stuff. So they put all that in there. So 3%. So like you guys are probably very successful business people on this call and you know, you're going to, you know, 3% of the people, you know, make it to the top. That's not a very good return on your investment. And then if you do, it costs you $2.8 million to do it. So they're just looking at ways to cut. And, and the other problem is that, you know, the facilities that they're talking about eliminating have deteriorated and in a lot of cases, you know, aren't nearly as good as these division one top draft picks that are coming out and they're playing at an LSU or they're playing at a Texas where they had like a 6,000 square foot clubhouse and great weight room and all that sort of stuff. And they're going to Pulaski, Virginia, you know, to start their career that, you know, is an older stadium and it doesn't work for them. It doesn't work for them. And I, I listen, as a longtime minor league baseball person who also was involved in owning independent baseball teams, the fact of the matter is I, I can see how it's going to hurt those communities. And I see their perspective of being upset. On the other hand, major league baseball does not need seven levels. They're going to end up with five levels. They're going to get rid of 40 teams. And I hate to say it because they had a dog fight on their hands and, and COVID-19 has eliminated that dog fight because Major League Baseball is going to get their way on this now. And, um, you know, some of these, you know, 40, 41 cities they were talking about this summer, 2020 was going to be their last summer. Well, those, those teams aren't ever going to come back. They're just going to, their last summer was last year. They didn't know it was their last summer, unfortunately for them. You know what I mean? Type, type situation. So, you know, it's, it's money and it's not going to save them a lot of money, but it's going to save them money and, I don't think the optics were great with doing it before COVID-19, but now it's like, unfortunately, there's a lot of businesses that are going to be in trouble. They're out of business as a result, and they're just going to kind of sweep them under the carpet, unfortunately. So yeah. what you're going to see happen, though, is I think that it could be good for independent baseball because you're going to have 40 markets, um, like like the Frontier League, where, you know, the bowlers, uh, the team that I founded was in the Can-Am League, but we merged this winter with the Frontier League. The Frontier League's already been contacted by Erie, Pennsylvania, and Lexington, Kentucky, who are on the list to be eliminated, and they want to come join our league. And the other reason why that's probably going to happen is that another cost-saving situation is that Major League Baseball is going to cut back the number of draft picks because they're going to have less cities for the, you know, the kids to work up the system. So instead of um, there being 40 picks, now there's going to only be 20 picks this year. Now with COVID-19, they're only talking about making five picks this year, but then in future years, it's going to be 20 picks. So there's going to be better talent that ends up going to independent baseball. And, you know, independent baseball gets players signed by Major League Baseball. It's kind of like a safety net for them. Um, you know, some of the teams that are really active at the major league level, like Arizona and Baltimore, traditionally have signed 20 to 25 independent baseball players every summer and inputted them into their single A, double A system when they need a player who gets hurt or, you know, need a new prospect. So, you know, it's one of those things, you know, from the ashes, opportunity will rise for some of those communities. And speaking about that, Ken, thanks so much for that response. But you talk about the the sponsorships and the money. I mean, with COVID coming out of it, I mean, what do you believe that the impact of COVID and sponsorships? Because obviously, sponsorships is a huge revenue stream, not only for baseball, for all sports. I mean, do you believe that there's a going to be pent up demand from sponsors to you know support promotions, or do you believe that that's also going to be throttled back based on the uncertainty of the market? Hey, Rick, that's a great question. It's so complicated, though. Um, you know, I mean. There, I read I read a study somewhere that just in the uh, from canceling from canceling the uh, NCAA March Madness and losing like you know uh, NHL playoff games in the beginning of baseball there was three billion dollars B with a billion with a B three billion dollars that was going to be spent on television sports advertising in like a ninety day stretch and so obviously that money has been pulled back and put on the sidelines and not a lot of that money is being spent. 
So I do think from you know a corporate sponsorship point of view, there is going to be some money out there that can be allocated. But I think the bigger challenge you're going to find is that you know, what's your return on investment if you're playing games in, in front of empty stadiums? Or you're playing games in front of stadiums that have a maximum capacity of, say, 25% of what they used to have because of social distancing rules and regulations that come into play. And then what are you going to do with, you know, your biggest number one corporate partner pretty much unilaterally across of all sports is your naming rights partner. So, okay. You, you know, you can't expect your naming rights partner to write you a check for, you know, 10, 15, 20 million this summer if you don't play baseball there. Or if you play baseball there and there's no fans there, okay, maybe you can justify a portion of that, but not all of that. So, so what are you going to do? You're going to give them a credit. You're going to give them their money back. You're going to add a year on the back end of the deal. You know, so I, I think that there's, you know, just a huge amount of questions that, you know, we, we can't even address. And, like, it's not even just sports. Like, even the local bakeries or your local real estate office and stuff like that. I mean, like, somebody said it best the other day, and this is the only time I'm going to give this guy credit for saying it because he just said it in a meeting yesterday. And so I, I'm going to give him credit because it's the first time I'm using it. But hereafter, when I use it, I'm not giving him credit. Is that, like, you can't even see around the next corner right now. I mean, like, literally, you know, our job as professionals in whatever business you're in, is to look down the road and, and help make good decisions based upon your forecasts and what your data and what your numbers are telling. We can't even see around the corner right now. So I, I, I think that, you know, teams are, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be some empathy, I think, from corporate partners and sponsors that, you know, not, I don't see everybody like pulling that money off the table and saying, take down my wall sign, because I think, everybody also understands that sports can be a unifier and sports can get people back into the right mindset, you know, in this country and not only this country around the world when it happens. So um, I think it's, I think it's going to be very interesting. Um, you know, people are asking me all the time about, you know, just like everybody else, when do you think sports is going to start and when is, what's it going to look like? I think it's going to be like um, starts and fits. Like I think they're going to start something and then they're going to go, Oh, this doesn't fit. This, this doesn't work. You know, we got an issue here that we really didn't think about. Let's dial it back. And, and that's in a lot of industries, not just sports. Like, I mean, I, I think from what I can tell from a distance, like the state of California has done a good job with COVID, all things considered, except for maybe San Francisco. But guess what? They opened up the beaches and now they closed the beaches, you know, because, you know, it didn't work right. You know, so I think you're going to see that with corporate sponsors that they're going to want to help. But they're also going to have to look at the damage that they've, you know, endured over here on the side. You know, a lot of times sports marketing can be looked upon as a luxury, you know, for corporate sponsors. Sometimes, you know, the ROI isn't there and they do it for the spirit of the community, which is good now because we need spirit in the community. You know, or they do it because, you know, the owner of that company likes baseball or whatever the case may be. But, you know, they're, they're going to have to probably make some cuts as well. So good question. Hey, Ken, Mike had a, a similar question along those lines, talking about some of the smaller leagues like the AHL, soccer, and even the NHL rely on gate receipts and concessions heavily. Can they survive without fans for a season? Ooh, I think they'll survive. I just don't think all the teams will survive. Um, you know, you get into a situation where the big, the big three, baseball, NBA, and NFL, their number one revenue source by far is TV. So those three sports trying to really figure out how to get back on the field without fans behooves them because you can get not only some of your broadcast dollars, but then maybe some of that corporate stuff that Rick just asked about, you know, you can justify, oh, well, they're playing and they're mentioning your name, you know, and you're seeing some signage, even though there's no fans. Um, but when you start dialing it back down to these uh, minor league team, excuse me, NHL, NHL's number one source of revenue is definitely ticket sales and subsequently the ticket sales is actually getting those bodies in the buildings and then the per caps that are generated by people spending money while in the buildings. So yeah, they, they, they probably got a little bit of a bigger issue and they also have the issue of that they don't pay their players once the playoffs start. So all the salaries for NHL players get played during the regular season. And so then the playoff teams, that's all gravy. So I think that what you're going to see 
on all levels at, at the top level, except for probably the NFL. But you're going to see current owners needing investment capital. So, you know, that guy that's never had a partner in Washington, D.C., you know, might need to go get, you know, a, a 15 or 20 percent equity infusion of cash, you know, to get get through this. Um, not what he had planned on ever doing, but they might have to do that. Or somebody that has two or three partners might have to have four or five partners, you know, and that's, you know, NHL, NBA, um, and Major League Baseball. AHL, minor league, oh boy. I mean, we already talked about minor league baseball and they're going to lose 40 teams. I don't think, I think the rest of their teams will be fine because Major League Baseball will prop up and make sure that those other ones don't fail, the double A, triple A, single A. Um, I think you look at an ECHL, you look at an AHL. The AHL will maintain a situation where they have 30 minor league teams, one for each NHL team. But I do think there can be some ownership changes there. Um, and then when you get down to the ECHL, which is double A hockey, which is 26 teams right now, I think three or four of those teams are going to go out of business. Um, I have my fingers on the pulse with the ECHL. I am considering an ECHL expansion team in Reno, uh, Nevada for 2021. And even now I'm like, you know, pumping the brakes on that a little bit based upon, you know, whether or not fans are going to be able to come back into the building. Because if you don't have the fans in the buildings at the minor leagues, you're, you're, you're definitely in big trouble. Um, I did a I, – I was hoping it was going to be released today or tomorrow, but it's probably going to be early next week. But we, we partnered with DLR Group, which is an architectural firm in Kansas City, Missouri. And they did the design for the Marlins Spring Training Complex, and then they did the ballpark for me up in Rockland. And so we took the Rockland CADs, and we looked at strict social distancing, six feet everywhere. That's a 6,000 seat ballpark in New York that right now with six feet uh, distancing, we're only gonna be able to put 12 to 1300 people actually physically sitting in the seats. So like about 22, 23% of the capacity. So I think minor league teams have to look at that and go, okay, you know, what are my numbers gonna be even if we do reopen this summer? You know, is it, is it worth it for me to reopen or am I even going to lose more money by reopening and assuming that you can sell 1,200 tickets when studies say 72% of the fans, you know, according to Seton Hall University, are not going to come back until there's a vaccine? Doesn't matter. You might not even need 1,200 seats in a minor league ballpark this summer. So it's just... I mean, nobody ever even saw this coming. And like, I, I would give speeches and I would give, you know, I, I would say, listen, everybody just, I, I kid you not, I've said this for years. Everybody just thinks that football is going to be here forever and baseball is going to be here forever because it's been here the last hundred years. It, it, you know, my father watched baseball and football and his father watched baseball. So it's generational, those sports, but it doesn't mean they're going to last forever. And like, you know, they used to consider throwing Christians to the lions, like a sport in Rome. I mean, like, obviously that doesn't happen anymore. So like, you know, I think we were just living in this fantasy world that sports was going to be here forever. And look at sport, the COVID-19 already killed the XFL. I mean, you know, they say that Vince McMahon has anywhere from 10 million to $50 million in outstanding debts on that league. And that guy's a billionaire and he's got a cash cow with WWE and he was, doing it better this time than he did it the first time and really wanted to make it work, boom, gone, you know? So it's, yeah, it's sad. I mean, science is overrun sports right now and I don't, I don't have the answers. I, we just got to be patient a little bit. And um, while we're talking about uh, that sort of stuff and what's going on with, with COVID right now, uh, John Gelati had a question about, advice for brands struggling to communicate with their audience. John, I'll go ahead and unmute you in case you want to um, clarify any of that. Uh, yeah, no, just looking for, uh, and first off, thanks for having me. I know I'm not a, I'm not a Canisius guy, full disclosure, but uh, I'm Matt Davison's proxy. I've been to a few uh, Canisius high lacrosse games, so hopefully that's good enough to uh, warrant your time. But just, uh, and from a marketing perspective, you know, I think every brand is trying to, is struggling with like, how do, what do I say? What, what do I communicate on social, on email, uh, digitally to my audience right now? Any, any advice on kind of what, they, what should be their focus? I, I, it's a great, great question. And it's a very broad question. 
um, and I think you, to a degree, to a limited degree, um, answered your own question with your question, and that is communicate. I mean, I think it's just, you know, it's just vitally critical to have brands communicating and, um, you know, relying on their core DNA. I mean, you know, and again, this is, this, this is a general 30,000 foot answer. Like if you specifically asked about a specific brand, then we could, you know, drill down into that particular brand. But in general, I think brands just have to look at their DNA and, and look at what their customers really identify them with and believe in them for. And then how do you translate that into how you can go help uh, the people that need help right now? Because there's a lot of people that need help and you know, you got your segments you know, of business that have benefited from this. I mean, the grocery chains have benefited from this and you know, the swipes market and all that sort of stuff, but the majority of the brands haven't. So you know, how do you align your brand, a strength of your brand right now with a weakness in society or a weakness in your community within which you are in order to help prop this thing back up. Listen, I will never talk politics with anybody. And this is a perfect example that we should not be talking politics because it is gonna take everybody, not just the president of the United States or you know the, the, the UK queen, it's gonna take everybody to help solve this. And I think a, big, a good solid brand you know, can, help, can help do that. Um, but they're, they're like, they're like handcuffed. I mean, like, think about like what Starbucks could really probably be doing if they were open, like if they were really truly open, you know, they could probably, you know, do more, you know, think about, you know, what a Nike could do if people were really able to go into the retail stores right now, or, you know, if, if little leagues are, are suffering because the kids, you know, they're not going to play or they don't have the money to play because their parents lost their jobs and Nike could come in and, you know, donate Little League uniforms and stuff like that. I mean, I really think right now, you know, everybody's been hurt and businesses, you know, got to take what resources they have left and what brand value they have left and, and put it to the good of the cause because not one person, not one brand, not one company can solve this. I mean, this is just, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, it is crazy. You look at 9-11, at least with 9-11, you know, it was a terrible, terrible thing, but you could see the buildings fall down and, you know, okay, we're going to rebuild them. I mean, we're not even anywhere close to like that scenario with this right now. So um, I think, but back to the number one thing, the brands have to communicate. I mean, and if you're not, if you're not communicating nearly every day, it's a great time to communicate nearly every day with your customers and your consumers right now, because everybody's home doing this. Everybody's on their phones, everybody's on their computers, they're all bored, you know, they're cooped up. Cabin fever. There's got to be a new name for cabin fever because we're way beyond cabin fever. I mean, this is this is something else. I got to figure that one out. But um, you know, just be strong. And the other thing, brands got to have good spokespeople right now. I mean, there there are people speaking right now that you would never imagine that would ever have spoken before. And and I'm like, I waste a lot of time just thinking of ideas that never go anywhere. But like. You know, you got all these speakers and stuff like that, and they go on and they speak and they're trying to talk about their brands or they're trying to talk about their initiatives and stuff like that. And then they're like dressed like they just got off the couch or like their background in their or in their photos are, you know, just like Wayne's World basement. Like the other day, Jay and I had a Zoom talking about this and he was in his basement and with paneling, and he looked like he was talking to me on a Wayne's World set, okay? <laughs> and now he's upgraded. You look good over there, Jay. You got a nice backdrop and everything like that. So Thank I you. think the brand just got to be professional, go to their strengths, and communicate. Well, I'll throw a little uh, we're not worthy out uh, for the <laughs> trophies at your background. <laughs> um, so we have a, a question from Tim. And Tim, I'm going to butcher your last name, so I apologize. Tim Trijanowski who asked um, just generally about the Pagulas and the- Is that Trigger? Yes, owning the Bills and Savers and the Harbor Center. Um, so do you want, I mean, they, I think you and I talked about this the other day, they've come under scrutiny lately for, lately for their management style and some of the decisions that they've made. Do you just want to talk about, um, you know, them a little bit and, and maybe is there a way for, is there a straightforward way for them to take some action to maybe, um, build back up their you know their image in the community or well first, first of all tim good to see you 
I'm I, like, I like the photo in the background there. We'll, we'll check it out. Why Why are you touching the trophy in that picture? It started <laughs> oh, in high school. I don't know. Maybe it was a prelude. It started way back in high school. Now you touch the cup and the World Series and everything. So it started That's back classic. in 84. That is classic. I love it. <laughs> hey, quick trivia for trophies, okay? I, I don't know. All right, if anybody can get this right, and it's a great question because it's happy hour. If anybody can get this right, I'll find something in my closet and mail it to you. I don't know what it's going to be, but okay. All right, question is, how many 12-ounce beers, okay, 12-ounce, not 18, how many 12-ounce beers can you put into the top of the Stanley Cup to drink out of, and how many 12-ounce beers can you actually put into the Prince of Wales trophy and drink out of? Because there's a top. The Prince of Wales trophy comes off in real life, too, and you can put beer and drink out of that. So what do you guys think? How many 12-ounce beers in each trophy? Trigger, I'm going to ask you first because you brought, up, brought this up. I'm going to say the cup, you can probably fit 12 beers in there. 12 Holy crow, you're absolutely right. You can fit 12 12-ounce 12 beers into the Stanley Cup. And I don't think when they made the Stanley Cup in the 1920s, they formulated it that way. But that is true. 12, right to the brim. But you never want to fill it to the brim because then it spills a lot of beer. Okay, Prince of Wales, what do you think? So the Prince of Wales, it screws off, so you're putting beer in the base of the Prince of Wales trophy? Uh, you're, you're putting it into the hole. It's like a, a, a cauldron. The top comes off and, you know, mm. it goes, it's skinny, not, tall and skinny. I'm going to say not as much. I'm going to say a six-pack. Okay, all right. So does anybody want to – we'll have one other person – uh, somebody says 14. Somebody in there <laughs> said 14. Um, the true answer is, believe it or not, you can put 18 12-ounce beers in the Prince of Wales trophy, and it just doesn't get the love and, like, the exposure like the Stanley Cup does, you know what I mean? But, but anyway, I'll send you something, Tim. I'll get your uh, email from Jay or something. But um, all right, so do you want to specifically about the Sabres and the Pagulas? I heard what Jay said and stuff. Is there, like, a, a specific portion of that? Well, that you're I, most interested in or what? I think it's interesting how not only they buy the teams, but they really, I, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but they really built up that whole area in downtown with, mm -hmm. the, with the Harbor Center and things like that. So, you know, that, that seems somewhat unique and that they've cornered another market with it. And just wondering, you know, what, what your perceptions of their ownership is in both leagues. Well, you know, it's tough to own two teams. I mean, you know, one, it's tough financially. Obviously, they have the money to do it, but you don't see it that much. Um, and I, I really think that I think they've been great for Buffalo. I think that they're, you know, they're new to the business, so they're trying to understand the business. And um, you know, I think you know that's just growing pains. Anytime you go into a new business and you're, you know, spending a billion dollars to, you know, 1.4 billion to get a, a football team and. 400 million or whatever for a hockey team. I mean, you know, that's, that, you know, they, they bit off a lot at the same time, but you know, thank good. They, thank goodness they did because, you know, you don't want to lose the bills. You know, you want the Sabres to be the best that they can be. And I do think that, you know, they, they were a little bit, um, you know, it wasn't their fault, but you know, they did those major investments with facilities that aren't great. I mean, I love rich stadium because I think there's great memories there growing up and you can get away with having not a great stadium in football because you really only have eight games it's tougher with hockey we talked earlier about the importance of the, the ticket sale and the experience in that building you know they built that the arena I don't even know what the name is anymore it's changed names so many times but you know honestly they built that on the cheap they only spent like 118 million dollars or something like that to build it um you know, and I, I think they built it to try to be all things when they really should have focused just on hockey because that was going to be their main revenue driver. But, you know, they wanted this big bubble and they wanted to put concerts in there and they wanted to put basketball in there. And, like, uh, to this day, I don't understand why they have basketball markings on, like, the concourse floor when I walk in there. It just, like, you know, just turns me off. That should be a hockey barn, you know. So I think they're a little bit – challenge with that and you know hopefully in time you know in money you can like move the facilities you know to a better you know modern version of what you need and we'll get to that in a minute but oh my goodness the hotel 
the the little practice center there that they built where Canisius College plays. I mean, that thing is gorgeous. That wood, that, the beams and the wood and all that. For true hockey fans on this call, I won't have to explain when I say that's a hockey barn. I mean, that is a great little, you know, ice rink. I, I've been there. I've never got to skate on the ice. I'd love to skate there. Uh, that has been very instrumental in getting, like, the World Juniors here, getting the NHL um, – kind of like the combine, similar to the NFL combine there, you know, letting Canisius College's program get to a greater degree. And so really um, a lot of these deals nowadays, when you buy sports teams, it's a real estate play too. I mean, you know, you want to get that land around, you know, your facility. And um, it never really happened um, with, with the Marlins, but that hundred acres that I mentioned originally, it was funny because in the deal for that 100 acres with the uh, county, when we did that deal, Wayne Huizinga had the right to be a 50-50 partner with anybody who built adjacent to any of the 100 acres. So like if a Marriott hotel wanted to come and build next to our ballpark parking lot, they had to go to Wayne first. He didn't get it for free, but they would have to go to Wayne first and say, Wayne, you know, you want in, this is the price to get in. So um, I think they've done that. And obviously they, they kicked up a few restaurants and, and stuff like that down there. Um, they moved their offices into that building downtown there too. And that cute little street with the bricks that I don't know the name about the top of my head, you know, it's, you know, been a development. So I think it can all come together for them downtown, you know, with the football stadium, if you can get that down there. But the huge problem is who's going to have the money to build that now? I mean, I don't want to say New York State's going to go broke, but, you know, they're in trouble. I mean, unemployment is going to skyrocket, has skyrocketed, you know, medical. Do you think if there's any money in the state coffers now, they're going to put it toward building a new football stadium or they're going to put it toward medical stuff, you know, and, you know, health, health related causes. So I think they're going to be very challenged. I've heard, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard too, that, you know, the Pagulas are buying up pieces of the land over there near the Perry projects and all that sort of stuff. I don't think they have anything contiguous yet that could, you know, build a football stadium, but I mean, I think that's got to be their play. Uh, you know, so unfortunately, sports, it doesn't matter if you're a player, a coach, or an owner. Sports is, you know, what have you done for me lately? Even when we were playing for Connie Mack, if we didn't have a good game the day before, what have we done for him lately? Nothing. I sat at the bench a lot. You know, you played every game, Tim, because you were good. But, you know, if you didn't play good, you sat. And so I think there's a little bit of that same mentality right now with, um, you know, the fans in Buffalo. Like, what have you done for me lately? And I don't know. I mean, I'm just being honest. The fact's the fact. You know, they laid off all those people the other day and, and either let them go or laid them off. They're the only NHL team to do that. So on the one hand, I don't think that's not a great message. On the other hand, it makes me wonder if they know something that everybody else doesn't know, which is, okay, the NHL is going to come back, but the six teams that, you know, are the worst six teams, which Buffalo qualifies right now, is not going to be in that 2014 tournament. And so they were kind of like, okay, you know, we're not going to be in the restart mode come July. So we're going to do this now. And, you know, and I get it. I mean, you know, you need new blood, you need fresh blood, but man, I mean, you know, it's tough. I mean, I'm very good friends with John Sinclair, who was the vice president of tickets, and he's been there 30 years. I mean, he's crushed. I mean, he is absolutely crushed, you know. Um, and, you know, on the flip side, you know, it all, all hopefully works out for John and everybody else and, and the Pagoulas. But I think that they've been, you know, overall a godsend for, you know, sports in Buffalo. Um, they just, it's a tough business because, you know what? I don't know what Rick Winnick does, and I'm not going to read in the newspaper what Rick Winnick does every day. Or I'm not going to go sit in a chair and watch Rick Winnick perform whatever business he does all day long. But that's what fans do. And so when they do that, they, they form opinions, which they have the right to do, and especially when they're paying for the tickets. You know, they have the right to form opinions. And, you know, the armchair quarterbacking, the Monday morning quarterbacking of, you know, people that think they can run professional sports teams better than the current people, I mean, it's mind boggling some of the things you hear about these people that they think, oh, I, I could come, you know, if I was the GM, I could do this and we'd win the Stanley Cup next year. If I was, and they have no idea what the salary cap is and how to manage the salary cap. And they know I have no idea how to draft the right players and, you know, move them up the chain at the right time and stuff like that. So sometimes, you know, I, you know I've met Mr. Pagula. I have not met Kim. I've met, I've met Terry. And, you know, seems like very good guy, very conscientious. And, 
I don't have all the reasons why what happened would happen, but I do believe that they're committed to Buffalo and to downtown Buffalo, which is a good thing. Thanks, Ken. So it's uh, it's 6.01 right now, and I know that you have a special project that you're working on that you asked to have a little time uh, towards the end here to talk about. So I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about your um, charity, and if everyone will just bear with me for a second, I'm going to put up um, Ken's uh, new charity project here on the screen. And, and actually, John, this might be something back to the uh, back to what you were talking about the branding situation. Um, you know what brand should be doing and stuff like that. I mean, everybody's their own personal brand, and then obviously they might work for somebody too that has a brand or. You know, they own their own company. That's a brand. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm trying to do, and we just announced this initiative uh, Monday the 27th, um, 19nomore.com is the website if you want to check it out and learn more, is that we're going to raise money um, here in the meantime, in the interim, when sports isn't being played, you know, we're going to raise money to um, then donate that money to hopefully find the right testing kits and and thermometers and sanitizing stations and different stuff like that so that when sports is ready to come back the fans can you know be comfortable about their safety and their well-being and stuff like that and listen there's a ton of great charity initiatives going on right now across this country and god i wish i knew leonardo DiCaprio that i could go do the all-in challenge like the fanatics and you know go play golf with bill murray at you know pebble beach but you know that's not you know that's not me uh, and then there's a ton of great food banks and food initiatives and stuff like that and PP&E for the frontliners. But I'm trying to, we tried to come up with, my, my buddies and I tried to come up with a concept that was sports related because that's our brand. Like that's what we've done successfully. That's, that's what we're about. And so this 19 No More is, I think it's, it's got a good uh, message. I think some people are going to have a little bit of controversial feelings about the message. Um, I'll get to that in a minute, but you know, the goal is to get uh, all the major sports organizations around the world, not just the United States, but around the world, because everybody's been shut down, to no longer issue the number 19 uh, on the field of play uh, when their, their respective leagues come back. And it's a tall order and it's a big ask. And uh, we are not saying, hey, do not take down Joe Sackett's number 19 from the Raptors. Do not take down Robin Yount's number 19, you know, from Milwaukee or Tony Gwynn or Johnny Unitas, all these great players. And, and the players that are wearing 19 right now, you know, the, the Jonathan Taves and uh, um, uh, Cooper from Dallas, you know, listen, your grandfather did. You can, keep, you can keep number 19 if you want to keep it. But moving forward, the, the team and the leagues won't issue that number 19 anymore to players, coaches, or league officials. And there, there's a little bit of a past precedent for that with uh, number 42 with Major League Baseball and Jackie Robinson in 97. Because when that announcement came out in 97, there was 13 Major League players that were wearing 42 that year. And at the end of that first season of that number being retired, six of them opted out and changed numbers for the 98 season. And then the other players, the two big names were uh, Big Poppy up in Boston, Ortiz, and then um, Rivera. Rivera ran where 42 to 2013. So, but now that's retired. It's out of the way. And so that's kind of our initiative is, okay, go to this website, sign this petition so that, you know, we get a bunch of groundswell um, to try to get, you know, the powers that be to agree to change this out. Um, now, there's three different approaches that we have going on to try to do this. And, you know, I've mentioned the petition. So that's like bottom up. So like, like, let's get the masses to send the message. However, you know, letters uh, and correspondence and any of the contacts that I know that I can get directly to commissioners of sports leagues around the globe have information directly from us effective this week on their desks considering this. So that's top down. And then we're also working on the players to try to get them either, you know, directly through some agents that I know or directly through the players that I know to also agree to give up number 19. And so that's kind of like a sideways in. That's like, 
hey, why don't you be the first player to give it up? And then, you know, your Twitter followers and your fan base are going to think that you're really conscientious and part of this movement, you know, and want people, to, the sports fans, to be healthy when they get back into their facility. So it's a very interesting concept, but I think there's going to – the controversy is I think there's going to be some debate about this. I'm actually doing a, um, a tape uh, show tomorrow on For the Fans, which is – a growing sport, a regional sports station. They only got 11 million homes right now in the U.S. and about 500,000 in Canada. But, you know, they're, they're going to have two guys debate the merits of this. Like, should we do it or should we do, not do it? You know, is it fair? Is it not fair? And so, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. But the easiest, maybe I got to hire Rick Winook to help me. The easiest right now, Rick, uh, is going to be the NBA for us because there's only eight players that wear number 19 in the NBA right now where NFL, Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, for that matter, and NHL are all between 20 and 22 players. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot tougher to, you know, get, get those leagues maybe to agree. But, I mean, this has just affected everybody. I mean, absolutely everybody. So I think that people are going to get it and understand it to, to a degree. So 19nomore.com. Sell, sign the, uh, sign the uh, petition. And then, oh, the other interesting thing we're trying to do um, is that you can buy a T-shirt right now that has that logo on there, but we're not producing the T-shirts yet. What we're going to try to do is, as leagues agree to, you know, set aside 19 moving forward, we're going to ask permission to get their logos and put them on the back of the T-shirt, kind of like a 5K track, um, you know, 5K T-shirt. And so it would be great if we could get Major League Baseball's logo and the NFL logo and the Premier Soccer League in Europe's logo and FIFA's logo and the rings from the Olympics and everything, like, on the back of the shirt. And so that's kind of the value of the shirt. Like, I mean, you can, you can wear the cause now if you want, but if we can get all those people to agree, and this is, like, the only time this would probably ever happen. Like, the XFL went out of business. It doesn't mean the NFL is going out of business, but because of COVID-19, everybody's business has been stopped. So it's a very unique time in sports, unfortunately. And, you know, hopefully this will be our little part to make it better. Thanks for that public service announcement, Jay. Of course, of course. So um, we're at a little bit after six o'clock right now. Um, I'm fine. It's up to you guys. I mean, I, you know. So, perfect. So why don't, why don't we do this? Um, of course, if anybody needs to leave, certainly by all means, um, before we officially close, I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming today and for being patient with whatever little bumps uh, we've had along the way here. Um, and I also want to let you know that we're going to do this every Thursday um, for the next three weeks. Um, the last one, I think it's May 20th, uh, Sam Russo is going to come. He's going to join us on a Wednesday instead of a Thursday. But um, we're going to keep doing these speaker series for the next couple of weeks while everybody's kind of stuck at home still. Um, so please, um, when you're done here, uh, go out to the web page and, and check it out. And if there's another one that you want to sign up for, please do so. We have uh, Dr. Harvey Young next week. He's the Dean of Students over at um, the College of Fine Arts at Boston University. Um, he's a, a pop, pop culture commentator uh, for CNN. He's been profiled in Vanity Fair. Um, he talks a lot about um, outside of theater, also um, race and gender communication. Um, he's a published author. So we're really excited to ha have him. The week after that, we have Mike McFadden from the class of 1968. Mike is a NOAA climate scientist. He was part of the team that won the Nobel Prize in 2007 with Al Gore. He um, figured out a way to predict El Nino, basically, and um, is going to talk about how that, that um how that affects climate change. And then after that, we have Sam Russo, uh, who's a local guy here. He's class of 2001, my classmate. He works for Lorraine Capital. Um, Lorraine Capital does a lot of um, investment in, in uh, second stage companies. I'm probably gonna screw that up. Spencer's gonna kill me. Um, but it does a lot of investment in, in local companies, uh, is really tied into the entrepreneurship and business space here in Buffalo and is gonna talk about um, kind of what he sees in mergers and acquisitions um, and, and Buffalo's business development now and, and moving forward. So um, again, uh, check those out. There's bios on our webpage um, and, and please, by all means, sign up, sign up for those if you can, if you're interested. Thanks again for coming. Um, with that, if anybody wants to say, and Ken, you're okay, um, I'll keep going. Um, 
I've got a couple of uh, I've got a couple of que pre canned questions we had talked about originally. You sort of oh, touched on them. Does anybody have any questions that aren't pre canned? Yeah, yeah. Why don't we do that? Since you have, since you've had the, here's a good one. Since you've had the Stanley Cup for two years, do you have any personal stories to share? Oof. Oh boy. <laughs> Jeez. I don't know. You talk about skeletons in the closet. There's a few skeletons in the closet from that. Um, I mean, let's just put it this way. Any of the stories, the most wildest stories you have ever heard about the Stanley Cup being at parties and being damaged and being thrown off of balconies into swimming pools, all true. That stuff goes on. I mean, there is there is no question. There is no question about it. And it's the most cherished trophy in sports. I mean, you know, uh, no disrespect. The NFL is you know much more popular in this country, but the Lombardi Trophy is not more popular than the Stanley Cup. I mean, it just it just isn't. So I mean, I don't know. You know, the, the bad thing is it, it was like such a you know it it was such a it went so fast. Even though it was two years, I mean, it was just like you know kind of hazy to a degree. Um, but I don't know. Actually, one of the interesting stories is that um, if you win the Stanley Cup, then you have you can access the Stanley Cup, so to speak. So, um, for instance, it was like several years later, um, and I was at I was at a hockey game as a fan, and it just happened that the Stanley Cup was was touring through that particular NHL arena that night, and I was there with a friend and stuff like that, and I said. Uh, I said, do you want to go get, you know, your picture taken with the Stanley Cup or whatever? And he was like, no, I don't want to stand in that line forever. Whatever, you know, the game's going to start again. I'm like, nope. You can go <laughs> you can go right to the front of the line like an express pass. And, you know, say we are, and we went right, right to the front of the line. So it's like one of those lifelong things. So um, I actually have, believe it or not, I actually have a better story about the World Series trophy than the Stanley Cup, only because the World Series trophy, again, doesn't have the cachet of the Stanley Cup. But I actually, we won the World Series on October 30th of 97. Then I was getting married a month later, Thanksgiving weekend. And I hired the um, team photographer for the Marlins to shoot our wedding. And, you know, my wife's great. And she was like, listen, Ken, you can invite whoever you want from the world of sports. But what I don't want is I don't want the sports wedding. You know, I don't want the priest up there trying to compare, like, winning the World Series to our marriage. You know, I don't want the, you know, the, the gift bags to, you know, have baseball logos on them or whatever. I'm like, okay, fine. No problem. No problem. So I have Friday night rehearsal dinner, rented out a whole restaurant because I was like, whoever's in town needs to come. I get there. We come and walk in last, and nobody's even paying attention. Everybody is, like, in the corner of the restaurant, like, around this table and I look over there and the World Series trophy is sitting on the table at our rehearsal dinner. And I, I kid you not, Brian, the uh, photographer for, uh, or excuse me, Dennis, Snapshot Dennis, gets a picture and you can see the word F-U-C-K on my wife's lips. You know, like he's like behind the crowd and we're like walking up and you can see her dropping an F-bomb. <laughs> I was like, I'm like, oh my God, great. We're not even married yet. I'm going to get divorced right over this thing. So yeah, it turned out to be a great thing and everybody got their pictures with it. And I mean, there's this great picture of like the sushi chef with the trophy in one hand and he's kissing a fish in another and it's great. So she goes to, she goes home. I go to a hotel. She calls me at midnight. She goes, there's no way that trophy is going to be at our dinner tomorrow night, right? I go, no, I have already talked to Dennis. That thing is no. And she said, okay, I don't know, three, four weeks later, we get the wedding photos back. There's all these pictures in the, in the book of people in the bushes outside of the reception hall, like in the parking lot, taking pictures with the World Series trophy because Dennis told them he had it in his car and they was taking pictures, pictures, pictures. So, so that was just, you know, that was just such, Things like that happen. You know, you can't drink out of the World Series trophy. It's not as popular. But the only reason why it happened was that Dennis was at Wayne Izinga's house Friday morning taking the Christmas card picture. And Wayne, again, who doesn't really care that much about baseball, said, Dennis goes, what do you want me to do with the trophy? Wayne goes, ah, just make sure it gets back to the office on Monday. I don't want to keep it here all weekend. <laughs> and so he drove it in the car and took it to my wedding. So there, there you go. But anyhow, good question. Um, so just as a quick antidote, Nelson says he has a friend whose son was baptized in the Stanley Cup. Oh, there you go. There you go. So those, yeah. those stories are it was in Detroit. Mm -hmm. It's 35 pounds and it's awkward. 
start, it is awkward. So, you know, once you start to have a few, you, you don't want to embarrass yourself and try to lift it up after a few because it's really, you know, it's bottom heavy. And it's 35 pounds, so it's, it's tougher than you think to lift up when you add a few. So uh, Ian Toner has a question here. If you were advising the NHL on its next U.S. broadcast rights deal, what would your counsel be? Do Bettman and co. need to bring more broadcast partners beyond NBCS into the fold? And if so, can they pull it off? Oh, boy, that's a great question. Um, harkens me back to the day when I thought I was a big shot when I signed uh, – <laughs> Signed a $5 million a year deal for five years on behalf of the Hurricanes when we moved to North Carolina. Was, for, was uh, Fox, Fox Sports Carolina. Was John Forsland around then? Oh, yeah. John Forsland's my buddy. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Oh, John's been there forever. And look, look at he's the heir apparent to the national voice of the NHL. Yep. I mean, I love the guy. Yep. Uh, but he had been at Hartford. I didn't hire him. But I worked with him for years. He's still my friend. So and he's got he's got that great voice. And never mispronounces somebody's name. It's like just unbelievable. I mean, the puck's moving so fast and, you know, he always gets the names right with all these European pronunciations and stuff. I love that guy. But, um, you know, the problem is with, with hockey is, you know, it's, it's such a better sport live. And, you know, it's the same old, same old. You know, it's tough to see the puck. I mean, granted, big screens at home and HD and all that have, you know, helped, you know, that issue a little bit. Um, but I think now, particularly with, you know, there's going to be the, there was already a major challenge in all the sports right now about getting live bodies in the building because people have these home theaters and, you know, these great places where they don't have to spend $12 on a beer. They can go get a $3 beer that they bought at Publix, you know, and, and drink that instead. So, you know, from that point of view, I think it's, you know, really important, um, for them to obviously enhance the broadcasts, um, I don't know the name of the company, but there was a report that going into the playoffs this year, they had found a way to get statistical data from the puck like 60 times every second. They were going to have data points that they were going to install in all the, you know, well, not all the arenas, but the ones where they're going to do national TV games and, and experiment with it this year. So I think something like that, you know, really is probably the next generation, you know, with analytics and everybody's so wrapped up in the numbers all the time. I mean, I'm old enough, unfortunately, to remember the glowing puck, you know, that Fox did, which, you know, hey, it got a lot of chatter, but then it was a disaster. You know, the puck's in the third row of the seats. And, you know, it was just, but, you know, it was, you know, listen, it was innovative. And, you know, they took a risk. It didn't work out. And I think probably that's, you know, what, what hockey's got to do is take a risk. I mean, I don't know. I'm probably, I got to probably be careful what I say because I, you know, if I get the right chance, I would go back and work in the NHL. But I do think that, you know, legislating some of the physicality out of fighting, you know, has, has taken away, um, you know, it's, you know, the age old, you know, debate, you know, more scoring, you know, you got to, you know, call more penalties, you know, more scoring. You can't afford to have a fourth line that goes out there to drop the mitts and fight with the other fourth line. I mean, I kind of get all that, but, you know, you take a step back, and I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not in, uh, endorsing violence in sports by any stretch. But you take a step back. Boxing is very successful sport. Uh, UFC is ridiculously successful sport. MMA is ridiculously successful sport. Um, you know what? I don't like to see brawls in baseball, but when you when they happen, they're on Sports Center. And they're breaking it down and they're breaking it down for three or four days when people go to, you know, appeal their suspensions and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, there's a natural tendency, you know, to go too far with violence in sports. And, you know, you can't have, uh, you can't have Todd uh, Bertuzzi, you know, smashing a guy in the head with a stick and all that. That's way out of line. Don't endorse that at all. But you know what, for, for the story of the game, you know, and for the protection of your star to have that fight or two to really get people back jazz and stuff like that. I'm all for it. Uh, and I think that would be good for, you know, the televising of it. Um, listen, I owned a minor league baseball team for 10 years. The Rockland Bowlers just sold them in February. The number one social media clip. And uh, Jay, where's that? I sent you that picture. Yes. Of the, of the fight. Hold on. Number one social media clip in the history of the Rockland Boulders is a bench clearing brawl. It's not, you know, the first, it's not the first player right there. 
it's not the first player that we ever signed that made it to the major leagues, it's, you know, for the Colorado Rockies. It's not, you know, having Nick Walinda. We had Nick Walinda, the Nick Walinda, the same guy that walked across Niagara Falls and the Grand Canyon and some volcano. We had that guy walk across our stadium, which he could have done with his eyes closed because it's nothing like those other things. But he always wanted to do it because his grandfather used to do it. His grandfather did like seven major league ballparks. And he always wanted to do a major league baseball park and walk across it on the wire. And they always said no. And we heard about that story. And we brought him and did it at our ballpark. That didn't even come anywhere close to getting the social media as this fight, this picture here, you guys can Google uh, Jackals Boulders Brawl. And that wacko right there in the red from the visiting team, one of the reasons why it went crazy social media was he was the pitcher for New Jersey. And he actually, he was the pitcher who actually was in the dugout after an inning of pitching. And he got so mad that he ran while the, the game was going, while our team was, you know, back on the field pitching, he ran from his dugout behind the umpire and the catcher into our dugout to brawl. And it, it was one of the ugliest fights. In the, and last I looked, I haven't looked in a while, there was over 2 million views. And this was a couple of years ago. There was like two. So, like, back to the question, Ian, I'm sorry, I got a little bit off track there. No worries. I, I think – I don't know. I mean, scoring's good. Uh, I think they need more scoring in soccer. I'm just a casual soccer fan, so I think there should be more scoring in soccer. Um, I mean, I've got all these crazy ideas about how you could do things better in the NHL, but I don't want to necessarily, you know, give those away until I get back to the NHL. But, you know, for example, um, you know, I, I believe that, you know, one of the things you want to do now this is to increase scoring, so now I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. Uh, I think you should be able to defer penalties in, in the NHL if the penalty happens in the last two minutes of the first or second period. So the team that gets the penalty, you know, that's going on the power play, gets to decide, okay, no, we're going to play five on five for the next 45 seconds, and I have a solid two minutes to start the next period with fresh ice, fresh players. The fans know that there's going to be a power play coming back for the full two minutes because statistics show – that the best chance, your least chance to score on a power play is when it's split up between two periods. When right. there's that break. Right. Because you send out your first line guys, you send out your first top pair of defensemen, and they play 40 seconds and then you go to intermission. Well, that, those two defensemen that are shorthanded, they're going to start the next period too. And your argument can be, okay, I get it. Your, your skill players on the power play are going to you know, finish that period and start the next period. But what if your skilled players were out there when the penalty was called against them and they're not going to play that last 40 seconds? Exactly. Now, you can't do it in the third period because then you're going into overtime and all that other sort of stuff. I mean, I also have done a bunch of research that, you know, says maybe there should be a half point awarded if somebody hits the goalpost. Goalposts are not hit that often in hockey. I mean, if you look at the research, it's not an official stat for the NHL, so I had to kind of do on my own. But on average, over the course of an NHL game, um, there is basically one goal post per team per game. So it basically evens itself out, but you have a situation there that uh, if, if it's a half a point, let's say, over 82 games, that's the equivalent of 41 more goals, you know, that have been scored. 41 more reasons that the fans are excited and the scoreboard changes and the strategy changes, okay? Because, because then – Think about it. If you're shorthanded, if you're, if you're losing at the end of the game three to two, you don't have to score a goal in the last two minutes when you pull the goal. you got to hit the goal post twice. And then you've tied the game, and you're going into overtime, which fans like overtime. I like overtime. So I think some of those changes, you know, I think they're going to continue to try to innovate that way to make, you know, hockey more interesting on TV. And as far as more entities, the problem is you only got so many on the national – basis you know that want to carry it and I just don't you know the, the big 800 pound gorilla has been and will continue to be ESPN and right now they don't have the interest they don't have the appetite they don't have the uh, the uh, time slots to bring hockey on in the winter when they do so well with you know basketball and college football and, you know college basketball, NBA college basketball, basketball yeah. like that. so I think that the key should be 
NBC Sports Network, which is Comcast property, you know, how do they grow bigger? You know, how do they get better programming? How do they get into more homes? And a lot of that has to do with, you know, the challenges that they face with the ESPNs of the world that have a lot of these rights tied up for a lot of years. You know what I mean? So, but um, I, I hope they can do something. I mean, the NHL is not going anywhere, but I just, you know, they're going to have their challenges uh, coming out of this COVID-19 with fans in the seats. So they're going to have to do better on TV for sure. Thank what you. Else we got, Appreciate Jay? it. Oh, no problem. And Anytime. Can you, we have uh, Mark Kubenik from 82. He's a goalie. You've upset him. Hit oh, the post boy. Oh, because of the, the goalposts? <laughs> But he had a question for you. Um, do you see growth in amateur sports as opposed to pro sports in the next 10 to 20 years? Man, amateur sports is a big business. There's no question. By the way, Mark, uh, they do call the goalpost the goalie's best friend for a reason because that means you've missed the puck. You haven't completely stopped the puck. So that's why I believe that it should be a half a point if you hit the post. It's not fair that Mark can't, you know, debate and you that. So go ahead, Mark. <laughs> Is that why he was upset? You shoot, you, you shoot wide when you hit the post. <laughs> ah, listen, it, it, it totally depends. Sometimes the goalie gets a piece of it and hits the post. Sometimes it's straight through on the post. I don't, I don't disagree with that. Uh, and don't get me wrong. If, if a guy hits the post on the left side and it bounces across to a guy on the other side and he scores immediately after it hits the post, it's not one and a half points. It would just be the, you know, the regular goal. But again, I, you know, it's just an evade. I Listen, I think they should do the same thing in soccer. I think if they hit the goalpost in soccer, it should be half a point. You if know, you if you take a shot, if you take a shot and you get you hit the post, your ass should be on the ground because my defenseman is there and taking <laughs> care of business. Good, and you know what, Eric? Then when your defenseman does that, then hopefully they fight and we accomplish <laughs> both goals: more scoring and more fights. I love it. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. But um, amateur sports, um, you know what? I, I think that the big concern for amateur sports, which has just been, you know, amateur sports just grows in general because families get bigger and there's more kids, you know. But, you know, I think that they're going to be really, they're, you know, you're going to have parents that are very cautious with, you know, integrating kids back into programs. And I'm not just talking about sports, you know, I'm talking about after school activities, just going to school for that matter. And I have to be careful when, you know, for full disclosure, I don't have any kids. So, you know, I, I don't have the perspective as like a parent would, but, you know, knowing, um, hey, AJ, can you take this down? Oh yeah, sure. Down because I keep thinking about that fight and all the stuff I was involved with that. So, um, um, you know, when you're, when you're a kid and you're in a situation where your parents are making the decision and the parents are concerned, you know, about the health and about vaccines and about temperatures and about being around other kids, I, I don't know. I mean, I live in Orlando and like we have been hammered, you know, everybody has their stories of woe right now, but you know, Orlando is not only known for the theme parks, but the, the home of the AAUs in Orlando, you know, Disney wide world of sports is in Orlando, which has tons of kids come in to play all different sports, you know, and, and their mm -hmm. abilities. So I, I think, you know, in time, just like everybody thinks it's, you know, the end of the world and the stock market, real estate bubble crash. And then we had like a great 10 years and, Trust me, I'm not the guy to be speaking about the stock market. You know, everybody thought that, you know, terrorism would ruin the airline industry. And you know what? The airline industry is in worse shape because of this virus than it is because of what happened with 9-11. You know what I mean? So I think, you know, with anything, the amateur and youth sports community is going to have to, uh, you know, band together and figure out what they're going to do next. I mean, you know, I have a little side consulting business on the side, and I was actually working, I have to be careful with that, what I want to say, because I'm under an NDA, but I, I was working on a group, New York City-based group, that wants to build some sort of sports academy in Central Florida. They don't want to build it in South Florida. They don't want to build it in Jacksonville. They want to build in Central Florida, close to the major airports. They have a very, very unique niche athlete that they can attract to this thing. And so I had been on the ground January, February, March, you know, doing site evaluation for them, site surveys and certain situations, some of the conversations I've gotten farther along with government entities that might be willing to invest in this investment along with these guys. That, I mean, I talked to the guy yesterday, I didn't talk to him in three weeks. I'm like, any update? And he goes, nope, we're just sitting tight. And I mean, they had, 
they had millions of dollars to invest in this thing and they're legit. Like if I told you who it would, who it was, you would go, Oh, we know, we know that amateur sports group. We know what they're doing with that particular. And, and you would go, it probably makes sense that they consolidate everything in one place and try to make, make it into a little bit of a different business model. But you know, now that, and so that, I can speak to 100% that that was a $70 million project for Central Florida that I'm not saying is gone, but it's definitely on hold. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. We'll see. Her. Cool. Anybody else have any questions for Ken? All righty. All righty. Well, I appreciate it, guy. Everybody stay. I don't know about you, but we're, we're being lifted down here. So hopefully you guys, uh, you know, stay safe. Hey, hopefully I can get to Buffalo for Father's Day weekend. My dad, my dad turned 90, okay? Let me give you a little last story. My dad turned 90 in January, so everybody came to Florida because he wanted to get out of the cold. You know, 22 family members came to my house in Florida and stuff like that. And so what do you get for your father or your mother for that matter when they turn 90? I shaved my head. I put 90 in the back of my head. I didn't tell anybody. I revealed it at the first dinner on Friday night whenever he was there, and my dad thought it was the greatest thing ever. So, uh, you know, the point is my dad's still up in Buffalo. I get to Buffalo, uh, huge, huge fan of Canisius. He walks through the neighborhood every day, even though he's 90. He's in great health still. So, hey, maybe we can see you guys. Maybe I can see you guys if I can get up there in, in a couple months if this thing clears up a little bit. So, but I appreciate your time. We appreciate you having me. You have on a – Yes, Ken. Thank you. Get me Tim's address. I owe him something. I will. I've got I've got stuff for you. <laughs> All right. See you guys. Good night. Take care, everybody. Enjoy your happy hour. Thank you. Thanks for organizing, Jay. Yes, yeah, of Jay. course. Cheers, Jay. You got it, guys. Thank you for coming.